Good evening, folks, and welcome again to our service this evening. Good to see you. Uh, let me just share the announcements uh, tonight before we uh, get on the way. Uh, tonight we're going to be continuing our sermon series in Mark's Gospel. We're coming to the closing section uh, tonight of Mark chapter 9. Uh, some well-known words uh, of uh, Jesus, and uh, we'll study those together in due course later on in our service this evening. Uh, you'll be aware, of course, of the news uh, this last week, the sad news of, of the death of Ernie Bell. And as you'll know, the, the funeral service is scheduled for tomorrow morning at half past 11 here, uh, followed by the burial uh, up at the cemetery, and then down uh, here once again for the refreshments in the hall at the other end of the building. Uh, if you're able to do so, please do stick around after the, the service to just help with a few things to set up for um, tomorrow morning. Thank you to those who've been busy already this afternoon getting some things ready. Uh, but if you're able to stay around afterwards, uh, just a, a few final things to get uh, prepared for tomorrow morning. Uh, that would be greatly appreciated. And of course, do remember the family in your prayers as well at this time. And pray for the service uh, tomorrow morning. On Tuesday evening, the women's meeting is taking place. That's here at eight o'clock. On Wednesday evening is our prayer gathering at half past seven. And as I mentioned this morning, we're coming to the end of our current series of studies looking at the threefold office of Christ as prophet, priest, and king. And then spending time together in prayer as well on Wednesday evening. It'll be great to have you with us for that. I'm taking the study up at Foil EBC on Thursday evening at eight o'clock. Then next Sunday, quarter past 10 for the Sunday school, Half past 11 for the morning service as we continue with our series in 2 Peter. And then in the evening, as I mentioned this morning, uh, we're going to have a joint service together with Crumlin Baptist Church. Uh, the two congregations will both meet here at 6 o'clock next Sunday evening. And the reason for that is that it's a special event with Open Doors. Uh, we'll have a representative along from Open Doors uh, to share about that work and bring God's word to us. Once again, we're very thankful to Alistair for uh, being with us and playing for us uh, tonight. Well, let's hear God's word now as we listen to these verses from Psalm 100 as our call to worship tonight. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. As I mentioned a few moments ago, we're going to be in Mark chapter 9 this evening. And it's a, a hard-hitting passage uh, where Jesus uh, addresses the, the issue of sin and the related matter of hell. Uh, Jesus speaks of, of both sin and hell a great deal in the verses that we're going to be turning to tonight. And it reminds us how desperately in need we all are of God's forgiveness and grace uh, for all of our sins. And we're going to sing of that forgiveness that is offered to us in Christ as we come to our first item of praise this evening. How blessed the one who has received forgiveness for his sin, whose sins are covered from God's face, whose death is cancelled in God's grace. There's no deceit in him. We're going to sing Psalm 32 verses 1 to 6 and we'll stand and sing together. Oh, 
please take a seat. We're going to continue our praise of God now as we come to him in prayer. So let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, in our call to worship this evening, we were reminded that you are the Lord. You are God. You are the one who made us. And we are the sheep of your pasture. And we thank you that this evening we can gather together like this as your people. And as we humble ourselves before you now in prayer, we give you our praise and thanksgiving for all of these things. We praise you firstly that you are God. You are the infinite, eternal, unchanging, uncreated God. You are Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We praise you that you are the Lord, the unchangeable I am, the God of steadfast love and faithfulness. And we praise you that you are our creator. You're the God who made all things. And as we survey the works of your hands, the things that you have made, we praise you for the beauty of the creation in which you have placed us. Most of all, Father, we praise and thank you that we are the sheep of your pasture, because you've gathered us to yourself, you've made us a part of your flock, you've placed us under the care of the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus, who came into this world and who loves us and who even laid down his life for us. And Father, we pray that this evening, as we gather once again for worship, that you would draw near to us by your spirit. And that you would conform us to the likeness of your Son, all for your glory's sake. And may all that is done tonight, as praises are sung, as prayers are offered, as your word is read and proclaimed, as we enjoy fellowship with one another, may it all be for your glory alone. Father, as we will be reminded in your word later on, we are those who are in such need of your grace and forgiveness for all of our sin. And we openly acknowledge that before you this evening. And we pray that you would teach us not to sin with such abandon. We know that we do it all so easily. That pretend and lie, envy and lust, criticise and distort. And making our excuses, we then expect an easy forgiveness for the asking. And so, Father, we pray, would you forgive us for our negligence of your holy character? Let us not misinterpret your patience with our sin as toleration. Loving Father, grant us a, a wholesome, godly fear. Cause us to number our days and give us hearts of wisdom so that we may discern your will in all things and walk in a manner worthy of your call. Help us, even this evening, to offer ourselves to you as living sacrifices, which is our reasonable worship. We pray all these things for your glory's sake, and in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Well, as we come to Mark chapter 9 this evening, we'll be reminded of those vivid and graphic words of Jesus speaking in terms of, of terrible wounds inflicted in order to deal with the causes of sin. But of course, we know that the forgiveness of our sin comes only through the wounds that have been sustained and suffered by Christ himself on the cross. And as we hear these words of encouragement from Isaiah 53, be reminded of all that Christ has suffered to win forgiveness for his people. Isaiah writes, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we have seen him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, 
and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Wonderful words of prophecy in Isaiah 53, um, prophesying in advance the, the death of Christ, where he was pierced for our transgressions, in order that we can be forgiven. Let's sing of that sacrifice that Christ has made and the benefits that flow to us through it as we come now to hymn number 220. Hymn 220. We shall stand and sing together. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Hymn number 220. We'll stand and sing. starting from verse 42 of that chapter, Mark chapter 9, and starting from verse 42. Jesus says to his disciples, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck, and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves, and be at peace with one another. 
This is the word of God and we thank God for his word to us today. Well, with those words of Mark chapter 9 in mind, we're going to turn to God in prayer once again now, with that prayer of thanksgiving and intercession. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we have just heard the reading of your words this evening, these very challenging words of Jesus. And we give you our thanks that even though we are sinful people, we are hell-deserving people, and yet, we know that Jesus himself, your son, has suffered in our place in order to set us free from all condemnation for our sin. And as we've heard already this evening, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. And so we thank you for the cross. We thank you for the grace and forgiveness that flows to us thanks to what Jesus has done for us, suffering in our place. We thank you that he is now risen from the dead and he has ascended to heaven where he is seated at your right hand, where he intercedes for us. We thank you that he has sent down his spirit who now dwells within us, and enables us to live changed lives. And so we pray, therefore, that we would turn away from all sin, that as we shall consider this evening, that we would ruthlessly eradicate from our lives anything that causes us to sin, that we might live lives that are pleasing to you. Father, we thank you that, that we can bring all of our prayers, all of our petitions before you, and at this time especially, we are mindful of the family of Ernie Bell in the midst of their grief. Father, we thank you for the great promises of the gospel. We thank you that for those in Christ, to die is gain, because to be with you is far better. And we pray, Father, would this bring great comfort to the family in this difficult time. We pray for Violet and for Shirley and for Albert and as well as this for the rest of the, the family circle, for our church family here, uh, for all of Ernie's loved ones, would you bring comfort to them in the good news of the gospel? And we pray for the service tomorrow morning. Again, Father, we ask for your blessing upon it as we gather here and as we hear your word read and proclaimed. We pray that you pour out your blessing upon us and bring great comfort and challenge through the promises of the gospel. Father, we think of others who are not able to be gathering here this evening, those who are unwell. We pray for Jean. We pray also for David. We pray for others likewise, unwell uh, at present. And pray for healing and strength, we pray. Lord, we lift before you Peter as he returns from his time in Portugal after this most recent trip. We thank you for all the work in which he has been engaged there. And we pray that even after Peter and his colleagues have returned home, that yet the effect of their ministry would still be felt, that you would bring fruitfulness through. We pray for safe journeys home. And even as we think of the work of the gospel over there in, in Portugal, that we pray for the work of the gospel here in this locale, that you would equip us as your people to take the good news of our Lord Jesus and share it far and wide with friends, with family members, with neighbours, with colleagues. And we pray, would you do a great work in the hearts of many? Would you bring them to saving faith in Christ? Would you build up your people and add to us, Father, those who are being saved? Because we ask it all for your glory's sake, and in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to turn to our songbook now and sing together at number 13, if you could turn there with me please, number 13 from the songbook, in Christ alone my hope is found, he is my light, my strength, my song, let's stand and sing. <laughs> Oh, 
Please be seated. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the wonderful assurances of the gospel as we've just sung. No guilt in life, no fear in death. And Father, we pray that even as we come to these challenging words tonight, that you would fill us with the assurance of the gospel and lead us on in godly living for your glory's sake. So help us now, we pray, in your grace, because we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if I can invite you, please, to have your Bible open there at Mark chapter 9 and verses 42 to 50. I wonder if you've seen the film 127 Hours. It tells a story, a true story, of Aaron Ralston. He was, or is, an avid mountaineer. And in April 2003, he went hiking in Canyonlands National Park. He had not told anyone where he was going. Whilst he was climbing there, he was hanging on to a large boulder, which then became loose. He fell down into a very deep, narrow ravine. This huge boulder then fell down on top of him, uh, trapping his right arm against the side of the ravine. And he was stuck, his arm wedged irremovably between the, the huge boulder and the rock face. He was completely on his own. He was in the middle of nowhere. He was miles from the nearest person. And after 127 hours of being stuck there, he realised that the only way to save his life was to take this radical step of cutting off his own arm with his penknife. It was not a film for the faint-hearted. And we come this evening to these very hard-hitting words of Mark chapter 9, these words of Jesus. And it brings us face to face with that very kind of gruesome imagery. It is not a passage for the faint-hearted. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and I want us to notice three things that he's saying to them and to us in these verses. And the first is this, understand that sin leads to hell. Understand that sin leads to hell. Now, Jesus has a lot to say about hell in these verses, and in fact, in all of the Bible, no one speaks about hell more often or in more detail than Jesus himself does. In fact, most of what we know really about hell comes to us directly from the lips of Jesus himself. And very simply what Jesus is pointing out repeatedly in these verses is that sin leads to hell. Notice how that pattern repeats itself again and again in these verses. From verse 42 to verse 48. Notice that every sentence that Jesus speaks begins with him talking about sin and ends with him talking about hell. Four times that same pattern repeats itself. Could Jesus make it any clearer? Sin leads to hell. And though it's not a pleasant thing to do, we must listen to what Jesus has to tell us about what hell is like. And the first thing is that hell is fearful. Hell is fearful. Just to the, the south of the city of Jerusalem, there's a, a valley known as the Valley of Hinnom. In some of the darkest days, of Israel's history during the reigns of King Ahaz and King Manasseh. This was a place that was used for the sacrifice of children to the pagan god Molech. 
Now, later on, the godly king Josiah came to the throne and he put an end to that brutal practice of sacrificing children. And in order to make sure that the Valley of Hinnom would never again be used as a location for pagan sacrifices like that, he made this valley the rubbish dump for the city of Jerusalem. All the rubbish from Jerusalem, even including the, the carcasses of dead animals and the bodies of criminals that had been executed, would be carried out of the city to the valley of Hinnom, dumped there on the big rubbish pile, whilst it was burned with fire. And meanwhile, the, the worms would devour what they could. They would eat their way through the food waste and the carcasses and the bodies that were found there. The Valley of Hinnom was a, a horrible place. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this valley became a, a metaphor for the place of final judgment, a metaphor for hell. This place that is synonymous with sin and idolatry. This place of rejection. This place of destruction. This place where fire burns and worms devour. This place that is so awful that nobody in their right mind would want to go there. The Valley of Hinnom became to the, the Jewish mind a picture of hell. And it's the picture of hell that Jesus uses here. In the Greek, the word that Jesus uses for hell here is Gehenna. Translates the Aramaic name for the Valley of Hinnom. Notice how Jesus speaks about the fire and the worms of hell, the fire and the worms of Gehenna. And when Jesus used that word, the disciples would know immediately what he was talking about. They would think of that stinking, burning heap of rubbish in the valley of Hinnom. And they would understand that is a picture of hell. That's not the only picture of hell that Jesus used. And notice in verse 42, he speaks of God's judgment in terms of someone having a great millstone hung around their neck and then being thrown into the sea. It's a picture of someone being sentenced to an awful, inescapable death. Elsewhere, Jesus uses other images of hell, a place of outer darkness, a lake of fire, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, a place of separation from the blessing of God, a prison, a place of torment, and so on. And all of these biblical pictures are intended to convey this simple point that hell is a fearful place. And it's worth asking, isn't it, what is it that makes hell fearful? Now, people often assume that hell is a fearful place because God is not there. But that is completely wrong. Rather, hell is a fearful place because God is there. He is every bit as present in hell as he is in heaven. But God is present in hell to judge and to punish sin. Now his punishment is fair and righteous and just. The judge of all the earth will do what is right. But that does not change the fact that hell is a fearful place. As the writer to the Hebrews puts it, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so Jesus is showing us here, sin leads to hell, and hell is fearful. But as well as that, hell is forever. Notice what Jesus says at the end of verse 43. He speaks of the unquenchable fire of hell. That is, it burns with fire that will never go out. And then in verse 48, Jesus speaks of hell as the place where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Jesus 
is quoting there from the, the final words of the book of Isaiah, gives us this, this chilling picture of God's judgment. If you were to go to the Valley of Hinnom today, the rubbish would be gone, uh, the fire would be out, those worms that devoured the carcasses in Jesus' day are long dead. But what Isaiah says at the end of his prophecy and what Jesus then echoes here is that the real hell is not like that. It is like a version of the Valley of Hinnom that never ends. The worm does not die. The fire is not quenched. Hell is forever. People sometimes speak of hell in terms of annihilation. Maybe you've heard that. They say that when someone goes to hell, it is for a certain period of time, and then after that, they are just annihilated, they are snuffed out, they just cease to exist. But that is not how the Bible speaks of hell. It's not what Jesus says here. Jesus says hell is forever. It's hard to get our heads around that, isn't it? In his classic work, A Body of Divinity, Thomas Watson used this vivid illustration to try and capture the idea of the eternity of hell. He says, imagine that the whole earth and all the sea and all the skies and all the heavens, the whole universe, is just made out of sand. And imagine that every thousand years, a little bird came along and in its beak took one grain of sand away. And he says, what numberless years would be spent before the vast heap of sand would be fetched away. Yet, if at the end of all that time, the sinner might come out of hell, there would be some hope. But that word ever breaks the heart. You see what Jesus is saying is in these very hard-hitting verses, sin leads to hell. And what is hell like? Hell is fearful, and hell is forever. And therefore, coming to our second main point this evening, Jesus also tells us here, be ruthless in dealing with the causes of sin. Be ruthless in dealing with the causes of sin. Notice how often in these verses, Jesus speaks about the causes of sin. He mentions things that cause sin four times in this passage. Now, what are those things that cause us to sin? Verse 42 kind of stands on its own in this regard. In that verse, Jesus is speaking about one person who is causing another person to sin. He says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin. Now, when Jesus speaks about one of these little ones who believe in me, what he has in mind, I think, is a, a relatively new, impressionable Christian. Someone who's a genuine believer, and yet at the same time they, they lack spiritual maturity, they lack discernment. And such people, says Jesus, are particularly susceptible to being led astray by others who will cause them to sin. And so there's an implied warning here, especially if you are a relatively young, fairly new Christian. What kind of people are you hanging around with? What kind of influence are they having upon you? Are they leading you towards sin? But also look at it from the other side of things and ask yourself this. In what way am I having an influence on younger and more impressionable Christians? And when they look at me and the way that I live my life, and the way that I speak, the things that I do, the way in which I interact with others, the, the way that I spend my time, the way that I live my Christian life. What influence does that have upon them? Does it influence them towards sin or away from it? Do they see in me an example of godly living? Or do they see in me an excuse for their own sin? Jesus is making it clear in verse 42 in that warning, sometimes sin can be caused by another person. 
But of course, we don't need anyone else's help in order to sin. We can sin easily enough ourselves. And that's the point of verses 43 to 48. In those verses, notice that the cause of sin does not arise through anyone else. No, in these verses, that the cause of sin arises within yourself. Jesus speaks of your hand causing you to sin, your foot causing you to sin, your eye causing you to sin. What does Jesus mean by these different body parts? I take it that they are symbolic. The hand representing the things that we do, our actions, our behaviours. The foot representing the places where we choose to go. The eye representing the things we look at, but not only that, also the things that we long for, the things that we've got our, our eyes set on, figuratively speaking. And Jesus is putting his finger on those things here and he's getting us to consider what are the things in my life that are causing me to sin? What things am I doing? What habits have I formed? What behaviours do I fall back into? That are just leading me into sin? And what places am I going to that I know are just putting me in the way of temptation? And what do my eyes look at? What does my heart long for? What am I looking at online? What am I watching on Netflix? What do my eyes linger on for longer than they should? Jesus is asking us to consider what is causing me to sin? Is it the people I'm spending time with, the things I'm doing, the places I'm going, or the things I'm looking at and longing for? What causes me to sin? I wonder how you'd answer that for yourself. And having considered that, Jesus' command is for us to be absolutely ruthless with whatever is causing you to sin. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off, says Jesus. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, it out. And of course, Jesus is using picture language here. He's not literally saying we ought to mutilate ourselves in these ways. But the point that he's making is obvious, I hope. Whatever it is that is causing you to sin, eradicate it from your life. Be absolutely ruthless in getting rid of it at all costs, because sin leads to hell, and hell is fearful, and hell is forever. So you get a, a friendship with a colleague at work that has become a bit too close, <coughs> pull back from it. Is it an inappropriate relationship that you're in? Call it off. Is it a, a website that you're visiting? Block it. Is it a habit that you've formed? Kick it. And you might think, well, that's easier said than done. How do we do all of this? Isn't that setting the bar a, a bit too high? Isn't that a bit radical? And this is where what we looked at in our sermon this morning is so vitally important. How do we live the godly life? None of us can do it in our own strength. But as we saw in our sermon this morning, the godly life is possible through Christ's power at work within us. By his divine power, he has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And so only with Christ's power at work within you can you do this. So pray for his help as you deal ruthlessly with whatever causes you to sin. And of course, it will be difficult, it will be painful, it will be inconvenient to do so. The imagery that Jesus uses here hits that home to us, doesn't it? It is difficult and it is painful and it's inconvenient to chop your hand off or your foot off or to pluck out your eye. But Jesus, you see, is telling us again and again and again, it is worth it to do this. 
See how he emphasises that repeatedly. He says, it is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Yes, Jesus acknowledges it will not be easy to live your life this way, ruthlessly cutting off everything that is causing you to sin. It will be difficult, and it will be painful, and it will be inconvenient, but it will be worth it as well. And he is telling us this because he loves us, and because he wants what is best for us. Think of that mountaineer, Aaron Ralston, trapped in that ravine, hacking away in his own arm, because he knows that it is the only way for him to avoid death. It was better for him to escape from that ravine with one arm than to die down there with two arms. And you see, Jesus is saying here, it is far better for you to go through the painful experience of hacking away at those things that are causing you to sin than for you to go easy on that sin and end up in hell. Be ruthless in dealing with the causes of sin. And then last of all, let's notice this. Offer yourself to God as a living sacrifice. Offer yourself to God as a living sacrifice. Look what Jesus says there in verses 49 and 50. He says, for everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Now what on earth does that mean? There are various different views about what these verses mean. Here's what J.C. Ryan says. I offer no opinion and make no comment on any of these views. That's his comment on uh, those verses. So J.C. Ryle has no idea. At least he's honest uh, with us. But what do I think? Well, tentatively, of course, I think that Jesus is probably using the imagery of Old Testament sacrifices here. If you read the Old Testament law, for example, the early chapters of, of the book of Leviticus, one thing you'll notice if you look at those chapters is that when a sacrifice was to be offered before God, often salt would first be added to the sacrifice, and then, once it was salted, it would be placed on the altar and burned in the fire. So salt and fire is the language of sacrifice in the Old Testament. A sacrifice that is offered to God, and I think therefore Jesus is saying to his disciples here, Consider yourself a living sacrifice to God. That is the mindset to have as, as you tackle sin. Consider yourself a living sacrifice to God. And yes, to fight off sin and to fight off anything that causes you to sin and to do so ruthlessly is going to be painful. But that is the sacrifice you must make if you're going to follow me, says Jesus. And so don't lose your saltiness. That is, don't turn away from offering yourself as a living sacrifice to God in this way. Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. And that's an unusual note on which to end, isn't it? Be at peace with one another. Why does Jesus suddenly say that at the end of, of the passage? It doesn't seem to fit in with the context, does it? But actually, if we pay attention to the wider context, it does. What has just happened in the previous paragraphs? Remember this, we looked at it last week. The disciples, in verses 33 to 37, have been arguing with one another. They've been arguing with one another because each of them wants to be the greatest. And then in the next paragraph, verses 38 to 41, again, we read of another argument that the disciples got into not amongst themselves, but with this other Christian who was driving out demons, and they tried to stop him in his tracks. 
And you see that the previous two paragraphs are both about disagreements, arguments that the disciples got into. And as we saw last week, at the heart of both of those arguments was this sin of pride. That the disciples each wanted to be seen as the greatest. And therefore they saw even fellow believers as rivals to be defeated and squashed. And that attitude led to these arguments breaking out. And it's as if Jesus is saying to his disciples here at the end of the passage, is it not the case that your eye is making you sin? Those proud eyes by which you look at your own reflection in the mirror and you think to yourself, surely I am the greatest. And then you look at another Christian down the road and you think, well, who on earth does he think he is? That is what is causing you to get into these arguments all the time. It's pride. It's because you long for being number one. Your proud eyes are causing you to sin. And as Jesus says these words, of course, he's just been saying to his disciples that he is going to Jerusalem in order to die and then rise again. He is going to humble himself. He is going to offer himself to God as a sacrifice for sin so that his disciples and all of his people can be forgiven of their sin. He was going to Jerusalem to suffer on the cross and undergo there in those hours on the cross the fullness of the hell that we deserve in order that we need never go there. And he's saying to his disciples here, if you want to follow me, you too must take up your cross. You must offer yourself as a living sacrifice to God. Humble yourself before him, offer yourself to him, and die to sin. Because that is the only way that you can escape hell. Sin leads to hell. It is fearful and it's forever. And so be ruthless with whatever is causing you to sin. And through Christ, offer yourself to God as a living sacrifice. Let's close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, these words of our Lord Jesus are some of the hardest hitting things that he ever said as he brings us face to face with the reality of hell. And he tells us that hell is a, a real place. Real people go there. And it is where sin inevitably leads. It is a, a fearful place. And worst of all, it is forever. And so Father, even though these are difficult things for us to think about, help us to listen to what Jesus says here. Help us to look to Jesus who suffered in our place at the cross, suffered the hell we deserve so that we can be forgiven. May we trust in him for forgiveness for all of our sins so that we know that there is no condemnation for us, no guilt in life, no fear in death. And then help us to be absolutely ruthless with whatever it is that is causing us to sin. Maybe it is the, the people we're mixing with. Maybe it's the things that we're doing. Maybe it's the places we're going. Maybe it's the things that we are looking at. Maybe it's simply the things that we long for in the secrecy of our own hearts. And whatever it is, help us to cut it off, so to speak. Help us to turn away from it radically and ruthlessly. No matter how difficult that might be, no matter what pain it may cause or how inconvenient it may be, because we know that it is far better to do that than to keep on messing around with sin and then end up in hell. And so, Father, would you give us the grace to do this? And we thank you that by Christ's divine power, he has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And so give us the strength in him to fight off sin, 
We thank you that he has already gone to the cross for us. He has suffered the horrors of hell because he suffered judgment in our place so that if we belong to him, there will be no condemnation for us. And help us now to offer ourselves as living sacrifices to you as we turn from sin and pursue righteousness. We ask it all in Christ's precious name. Amen. <coughs> Well, as we consider what Jesus has said to us tonight in those words about radically and ruthlessly getting rid of sin from our lives and offering ourselves wholly and fully to God as living sacrifices, let's, uh, let's close by singing these fitting words of hymn number 680. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Hymn number 680, and then we'll stand and sing.